So I don't know if any of y'all were online at the end of 2022. I mean, I certainly freaking wasn't. I personally needed like a break from the internet and to take some time to give myself a little bit of self-care. And yet somehow, despite all of this, I somehow, through the grapevine, managed to hear about how Andrew Tate was sent to prison. Now, I guess I should probably back up and provide you with a little bit of context. First of all, who is Andrew Tate? That's a really good question, and I have to be honest with you. I didn't actually know who the guy was until fairly recently when he, without my knowledge, slipped into my consciousness. I don't exactly know how or when I knew who this Andrew Tate guy was. I just somehow know who he is. And that's probably because over the last couple of years, he has skyrocketed in popularity, particularly amongst young, impressionable men, which is... A little bit concerning considering like what he's known for. So the TLDR of Andrew Tate is that he was a kickboxer who at some point was on Big Brother and pretty much from the moment he gained any amount of clout uh, the controversies about him began circulating. For example he was almost immediately kicked off of the Big Brother show for reasons that at least as far as I understand, were never fully confirmed by the show, which naturally led everybody to do a bunch of sleuthing and to dig up literally every single controversy that he had been involved with at around that time. And this was all used as fodder to generate speculations. Like, some people speculated that he was kicked off because of some hateful tweets. Other people speculated that it was related to a video which had recently resurfaced of him, like, beating a woman with a belt, and then other people speculated that it had to do with some of the criminal investigations that were going on around him at the time. However, fortunately for Andrew, none of this was about to hold him back. So soon after being kicked off of Big Brother, he went on to start his own online business where he sold courses that taught men how to get rich and how to get women. <laughs> Hi, editing me here. I should just point out that I am glazing over a lot of information here. Like, even just in his, like, course offerings, apparently there was some, like, webcam scandal. Apparently, most of his online course business was propped up by a social media pyramid scheme where he had people, like, re-upload videos of him in order to get clicks on their videos to, like, make money. I don't know. Like, there's like a lot of like seedy stuff going on here. But yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention that so y'all know I'm not trying to downplay some of the some of the things that this that this fella has been involved in. Now, up until recently, he was banned from pretty much every social media platform, but after Elon Musk bought Twitter, he unbanned a bunch of people, one of those people being Andrew Tate. And so I decided to do a little bit of perusing. So yeah, let's read some of his tweets and see what all of the hype is about him. Like, let's see why this guy, why this guy is so beloved by people, apparently. When you truly recognize every experience is fleeting, you learn to smile in the rain. You see the beauty in the raindrops and the absolute silence of solitary. There's even beauty in the blistering cold. Every one of you reading this, take 15 minutes of your day to make yourself a nice warm cup of tea. Truly appreciate its warmth and understand a day may come when you'd pay $10,000 for that cup of tea. There is no light without dark, such as the way of Wu Don. Who is Wu Don? The smallest and most casual things are truly beautiful in hindsight. I'd pay $10,000 for a hot coffee or a hot shower. You have been taking the sun for granted as it rests on your hand while you drive to work. You don't fully appreciate your last glass of clean water. Or you have this video about masculinity and how masculinity is about doing what you're told, especially if you don't want to do it. The baseline of masculinity as a whole is the thing that makes a good man a man is that he does what he doesn't want to do. He doesn't want to work and he works anyway. He doesn't want to go to war and he fights anyway. He doesn't want to get up, he gets up anyway. That's the whole point of it. We didn't want to die in the Titanic. Guess what happened? We died in the Titanic. You can't sit there as a man and say you don't feel like it. You're not allowed to not feel like it. You're supposed to do it anyway, regardless. Fascinating. Now, again, I just want to reiterate that even though I've been talking about him for the last, like, I don't know, five, ten minutes, this is not a video about Andrew Tate. Like, I swear, I'm not, I don't care about Andrew Tate, okay? He's not important to me. However, I bring him up because when the news broke that he was being jailed, a lot of conversation was generated about the dangerous rise of Andrew Tate, which in turn got people talking about men's self-help or like the lack thereof. So the first question, what's the deal? Like, 
Why did Andrew Tate become so popular? Well, the most common explanation is that men are in crisis, and there is actually some data to support this. According to Dr. David Williams in the American Journal of Public Health, across a broad range of indicators, men report poorer health than women. And just to name a few of the indicators listed in this paper, uh, men have higher death rates than women, men suffer poorer health outcomes across all socioeconomic groups, and men are overrepresented in stigmatizing social conditions like incarceration, homelessness, unemployment, and institutionalization for substance use and severe mental illness. And the list goes on. And so the TLDR is that something's going on with us boys. We're struggling. Things aren't great. I think most people can agree when they see these statistics that there is something going on here. However, when asked for the reason as to why these things are happening, well, this is where the conversation gets spicy because everybody has their own explanation for why for why men seem to be struggling these days. But the answer that I see to this question most often is that men are having a quote, crisis of masculinity. Masculinity is in a crisis. Our culture attacks, disparages, undermines, and attempts to destroy masculinity. Men are in crisis, Tucker, as you pointed out. I mean, listen, we've got at least 16 million men in this country who are out of the labor force. They're not just unemployed, they're not even trying to work. And I'm talking about able-bodied men, prime age men. There seems to me to be for years an incredible lack of strong men, clear men, powerful men in this world. Do I think we have a crisis of masculinity? Yes, I think that there aren't many firm places for men to stand at the moment. So back in 2022, our two favorite boys, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, were promoting their new Daily Wire show called Dragons, Monsters, and Men, which is a series that, quote, teaches men how to be men. And during this talk, Ben asked Jordan, Why do you think there is such a crisis of masculinity in the first place? And why are there so many people out there who are angry at you for even talking to men? And Jordan responds, like in the way Jordan always responds to these types of things. Well, I think it's, I think you could think about it as a consequence in some sense of the lack of a concept of original sin, oddly enough. I mean, people bear an existential burden, you know, it's an intrinsic part of life to, I suppose, to feel guilty in relationship to nature. Lots of big words. Lots of very long sentences that I have a hard time, like, understanding. I know that a lot of people like Jordan Peterson, but... I don't know. I think I might just be too dumb to understand what he's saying half the time. Anyway, so I listened to his response to Ben, like, several times, and basically I think the gist of his response is that men are demonized on all fronts. And as a result, the best that they can do in order to be, like, acceptable by society is to... Well, let's say castrate yourself. How would that be? And that would be real comical, except that it's also happening. In other words, men are being forced to deny their fundamental nature, which is what is fueling the crisis of masculinity. Okay, so personally, and here's my like steamy hot take. I don't really think there is like a crisis of masculinity. <laughs> I mean, I definitely think that there is something going on with men, but the term crisis of masculinity, at least in my opinion, doesn't really summarize it. Instead, I think that there are a few things going on right now that can largely explain why the boys are struggling. So let's just start from the top. So, thing number one. Ugh. What is on my tongue? Like hair in my mouth. Ugh. Literally hate that. So thing number one, harsh economic conditions and conspicuous consumption. So over the last several decades, economic conditions have become more and more difficult for more and more Americans. So just to provide a little bit of context, in the past, at least in the second half of the last century, uh, the general pattern of life that people followed involved 
going to school, working hard, having a family, buying a house, and then hopefully retiring at around the age of 60. Like this was just kind of what you did to live a good life in America. However, increasingly, this is just not a realistic life path for most people. And there are actually a ton of different reasons that can explain this, but just to name a few, wages have remained stagnant for the last few decades despite growing economic productivity. Inflation has accelerated, especially over the last few years, making everything more expensive and retirement less feasible, wealth inequality has been skyrocketing, car-dependent suburban developments have become the norm despite being expensive for residents and financially unsustainable for municipalities, and America's most powerful people favor the share value of companies over the well-being of people, resulting in our government financially supporting the wealthy and their companies while increasingly abandoning the needs of the middle and working class. So... Yeah, we have that situation, you know, the casual like impending economic collapse of the United States. We love this journey for us. But what makes this even worse, or at least the perception of this even worse, is that as a culture, there seems to be a growing pressure for all of us to show off and to flaunt what we have. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this, but the reasons notwithstanding, the way that most people show off their wealth is through conspicuous consumption, which is basically a fancy term for flexing. This phenomenon has been greatly amplified over the last decade. Like we used to only have to deal with seeing, you know, our annoying rich neighbors flexing their fancy new car or their new hideous expensive clothing. Now, however, our attention is increasingly monopolized by the world's richest people. And as the lifestyle of the rich becomes more and more normalized in our minds, so too does the contrast between what we actually have and what we think we should have. And so taken together, many of us expect to have more, even though we increasingly have less. And this by itself is more than enough to generate a certain level of discontent and frustration, especially when the gap between what we have and what we expect to have seems to be growing at an accelerating rate. And I think that this has had a particular effect on the psychology of men because most men were raised with the belief that they will grow up to be providers for their family. And unfortunately, this possibility is increasingly out of reach for more and more men. And because men feel like they can no longer fulfill what they believe to be their societal function, they feel a loss of identity, they feel increasingly helpless, and they feel disenfranchised. And honestly, I would argue that this is like the major cause of like what we're seeing with some of these like negative indicators growing amongst the male population. Like it's not so much that we're in a crisis of masculinity, we're just in like a crisis. And yet despite this, some men are very quick to blame this crisis on a completely different societal shift namely the rise of gender equality. So reason number two, gender roles have changed. So these days, gender roles really aren't as strict or as rigid or as distinct, which I think is a great thing. Like nowadays, women are no longer pressured and expected to get married, to have kids, and to dedicate their entire lives to domestic mastery like now they can stay single they can opt out of having kids and they can have their own careers in short men and women are becoming more and more equal and like we all know this right i mean there's still some areas we need to improve like the gender pay gap but things are like a lot better now than they were 50 years ago, at least from an equality point of view. However, and I'm going to make a little bit of a leap here, although I think it's like a very well-founded leap, so it's not really that big of a leap actually, but I'm going to make a little bit of a leap here and say that I think that there are some men out there, particularly like the red pill manosphere types, who in some ways feel far more threatened by feminism than they do by like the destabilizing world economy which, I don't know, that's just, like, batty when you really think about it. Like, whenever you read a lot of discourse, like, on the manosphere, so much of it is centered around how they can, like, get women, or really, more often, it's centered around, like, how they can control women, how they can, like, game women. There's, like, this weird obsession with, like, trying to sort of, like, systematize, like, women's behavior and to try to, like, hack into it so that they can, like, 
manipulate and control women and they're so adamant about this that there's like this whole aspiration in certain corners of the red pill movement towards developing what is called the dark triad of personality traits which are psychopathy narcissism and machiavellianism that is becoming self-serving detached and cunning is considered like the optimal way of getting of getting the girlies, so to speak, by some of these like manosphere guys. And again, I just find this very interesting because it just kind of lays bare how there are a lot of men who base a lot of their identity off of being able to like subjugate and like control women. And I think for these men, gender equality is viewed as a massive existential threat. Such a massive threat that they are resorting to weird methodologies to feel in control. Now, there's a lot more that I could actually say about all of this, but I feel like this video is already going to be like way too long. So instead, I'm just going to point you to another very good video that talks about this in a much more articulate way than I ever could. So yeah, I recommend checking that one out, but not until you finish this one, okay? Now, there's one more thing that I think is responsible for the supposed crisis of masculinity. And this is a phenomenon that I'm just going to call male objectification. Reason number three, male objectification. So whenever I say male objectification, I'm not talking about like turning the male gaze towards other men. I'm not talking about Magic Mike. I'm not, I'm not talking about sexual objectification here. Although this tends to be one of the first things we think of, probably because the most well-known and arguably most visible form of objectification that we're all aware of is the sexual objectification of women. Like we've all seen the Hardee's commercials. We've all seen the Sports Illustrated magazine covers and the unhinged reactions people have when they don't like them. No, I looked at the Sports Illustrated cover and they had a, a, a rather overweight young woman, quite symmetrical, so nice facial features and so forth, um, with a very revealing swimsuit on the cover. And I thought, no, <laughs> like, not, not in a personal way, but it's unbelievably manipulative for about three different reasons. The However, sexual objectification is really just like one specific type. In fact, philosopher Martha Nussbaum, I don't know if I said her name right, Nussbaum? Martha, I'm sorry, Martha, I'm bought, I'll just call you Martha. So Martha provides a much more comprehensive definition of objectification, asserting that it is, quote, the seeing and or treating a person as an object. It involves treating one thing as another. One is treating as an object what in fact is not an object, but a human being. And she believes that objectification includes at least one of these seven features, specifically instrumentality, denial of autonomy, inertness, fungibility, viol violability, violability. violability, and denial of subjectivity. And some have even extended this to include three other features, namely uh, reduction to body, reduction to appearance, and silencing. And when we're thinking in terms of like this kind of broader definition of objectification, it becomes clear that although women definitely experience a lot of sexual objectification, there are other forms of objectification that they have to deal with as well. So The Handmaid's Tale is a story that takes place in the Christo-fascist dystopia of Gilead, in which women are dehumanized and expected to fulfill very specific functions. Now, obviously, Gilead is like a hyperbolic hell vision of what America could become if we go down the wrong path, and hopefully we don't go down that path, but... I bring this story up because a lot of the roles that the women in this story are expected to fulfill directly mirror the sort of like gender roles that already existed in America at the time of this book's writing and that still continue to exist today. So in the world of Gilead, unless, you know, a woman is lucky enough to become an aunt, she's forced into the role of either a wife, a handmaid, or a Martha. So wives basically are men's public-facing partner Handmaids are expected to bear children, and Marthas are expected to perform domestic tasks. And any woman who cannot or refuses to fulfill the role that they're assigned to is deemed an unwoman and sent off to work in these like toxic nuclear fields. And then there's also econo wives, and econo wives are basically 
the wives that like poor men have because they can't afford to have three different wives for each of the tasks. And Econo wives basically do all three things. But I guess they can be like promoted to a wife if they do a good job. I, I don't really know, okay? Now, without going too far into the weeds of feminist theory here, we can actually analyze these roles using Nussbaum's framing and we can see that all of these roles have different features of objectification. So for one thing, when we look across all of these roles, we see that women are heavily instrumentalized. That is, they're not regarded as like complex autonomous people. Instead, they're viewed and treated as a means to perform hyper-specific functions. So handmaids, for example, are instrumentalized as tools of reproduction and childbearing. They're also denied autonomy through very strict social controls. And they're also treated as fungible because ultimately, you know, handmaids are viewed as just objects to use for reproduction and nothing more. And if I remember correctly, if handmaids can't bear children, I think they can like get in trouble for that. Or like oftentimes like men will get rid of a handmaid if they fail to have kids after a certain number of attempts or something like that. Now, what's really interesting to me about Handmaid's Tale is that you can see these sort of features of objectification even in like higher ranking women, like wives, for example. For example, they're denied autonomy and they're regarded as inert. I mean, wives are strongly discouraged from performing really any sort of like labor intensive work. I mean, something that's alluded to several times throughout the book is just that the main wife, Serena, is like perpetually bored and she's like constantly trying to find sort of like little tasks to keep her busy and to keep her from getting like extremely bored basically they're also reduced down to their appearance i mean one of their main functions is to look good for their husband and that's also why they tend to be discouraged from doing work their husbands don't want them to like ruin the sort of like image of purity that they're supposed to be cultivating and so what we can see in the world of gilead is that all women are like highly objectified and again as i understand it a lot of this echoes the same sort of oppression that women have historically had to deal with under the forces of patriarchy. Now, there's a lot more that we could go into here, but like the point I'm trying to make, honestly, is that objectification is like a very broad, it's like a very broad set of behaviors. And so along those same lines, I would actually argue that men, you know, despite their relative privilege, especially with respect to women, I would argue that men experience their own specific type of objectification. However, instead of being regarded as objects of sexual gratification and reproduction, I would argue that men are often reduced down to objects of violence and labor. You can see a lot of this like male objectification within ideals of masculinity. For example, we often expect men to be protectors and women to be protected. The underlying assumption here is that men need to disregard their own physical safety and that women are in some way helpless. And one of the consequences of this expectation is that we may shame men who choose to look after their own safety and to protect themselves. And I think one example that illustrates this all very well is the Titanic. We didn't want to die in the Titanic. Guess what happened? We died in the Titanic. Speaking of that, I think they're re-releasing like a remastered version of that in theaters. And I will definitely be seeing that because Titanic is probably like, honestly, like probably one of my favorite movies. So if you remember in the Titanic, there weren't enough lifeboats because dumbasses. And so they end up prioritizing saving women and children first. For the time being, I shall require only women and children. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that this is necessarily bad, nor am I even saying that this is really representative of how most like maritime disasters were handled. Apparently, this was actually not a protocol that was a norm for most shipwrecks at that time, which is evidenced by the fact that in many maritime disasters, a disproportionate number of deaths come from women and children. And so maybe that's actually why in this specific situation, this was the protocol that was enforced. However, the idea that men should be, you know, willfully self-sacrificing was extremely popular. It was so popular, in fact, that some of the higher profile men who ended up saving themselves, like Joseph Ismay, faced an unbelievable amount of public shaming. Consider Bruce Ismay, shipowner, multimillionaire, and coward. On that awful moment when it was known that the great Titanic, man's proudest triumph of shipbuilding, was doomed to go to the bottom, the men aboard her stood aside to give the women first chance of life. The men stood aside, but Bruce Ismay did not. 
He was one of the first in the boats, among the women and children, the helpless ones whose right to life lies in their helplessness. Now, the prevailing narrative in the tabloids at the time was that Ismay, like, selfishly abandoned ship in order to save himself. However, this was actually in conflict with his own testimony, which was that he had actually helped to save several different people, and when the ship was literally on the verge of sinking, there was a lifeboat that had some empty spots in it, there weren't any other people nearby that he could save, so he hopped in. Obviously, we don't know the actual facts of the situation, but people were highly inclined to believe the first story, that he abandoned ship and cowardly decided to save himself. And yeah, his reputation was like severely tarnished by this. So tarnished, in fact, that a hundred years after the Titanic sinking, his extended family attempted to clear his name, claiming that he was unfairly treated by the American and British press. It's like literally a hundred years after this happened, and people were still talking shit about him. In addition to, you know, generating a bunch of rumors and hate mongering around the cowardice of Ismay, you know, there were also a lot of stories comparing his cowardice to the honorable death of Captain Smith, who stayed behind and actually went down with the Titanic. Even in modern day portrayals of these events, like the 1997 Titanic movie, many of these portrayals uphold a lot of these narratives and a lot of these rumors. In the movie, we see Joseph pressuring the ship captain to accelerate the ship in an attempt to woo the press upon its early arrival. We are making excellent time. The press knows the size of Titanic. Now I want to marvel at her speed. And if this were true, this would actually implicate Joseph in the ship's crashing because, at least according to the movie, the whole reason the ship hit the iceberg to begin with was because it was traveling like hella fast in the middle of the night. So this sort of places most of the blame for the ship's crashing on Joseph. And then later, like when all hell has broken loose on the Titanic, we see Joseph sneaking off into one of the last remaining lifeboats under the disapproving glare of crew member William Murdoch. Very shameful, very embarrassing, how dare you? Now, I think it's just important to reiterate that all of these events are based off of unfounded rumors, yet they all serve to reinforce this idea that Joseph was like this spineless coward who somehow managed to evade a catastrophe of his own making. What's really interesting is that there was a very similar type of outcry not too long ago. So back in 2012, the Costa Concordia sank, and people were subsequently shocked to learn that, quote, some male passengers ignored informal injunctions to wait until women and children had made it onto the lifeboats. Informal injunction is basically a fancy way of saying a rule that doesn't fucking exist. But nonetheless, many articles at the time echoed this exact same shock. Costa Concordia cruise ship crash. So much for women and children first. Women and children last? Mark Stein, no more women and children first. Costa Concordia reveals its darkest secrets. She too was unable to get on the packed lifeboats. So much for women and children first. Now, I personally find these article headlines to be absolutely batty. I mean, don't get me wrong, these shipwrecks were absolutely terrible, but some of these articles almost make it seem as though these men who saved themselves were responsible for the shipwreck. Like, what kind of idiot would expect men to shoulder all of the responsibility for these types of catastrophes? So, lately there's been this catchphrase going around that goes something like, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. The idea being that men shoulder all of the responsibility for making society good, but if men become too comfortable and too complacent, society becomes more vulnerable and eventually becomes bad. Now, this statement actually connects into something a little bit bigger than just guys being masculine versus cucked. Namely, it illustrates the connection between masculinity, the military, and war. Now, just for what it's worth, this entire topic is actually massive, and it kind of deserves a video of its own, but I just wanted to touch on it here because it's kind of crucial to understanding what I'm calling male objectification, but what some people like to call toxic masculinity, and what other people like to call male disposability. So war is, like, fascinating to me. I mean, it's absolutely terrible, but it's it's undeniably fascinating. Like, you literally have a situation where you have, like, two or more giant countries 
who have managed to mobilize thousands of people, human beings, just like you and me, to go off and like slaughter one another. Like it's logistically impressive for one thing. I mean, just to get that many people to go do anything. But even more mind boggling is just the underlying psychology. Like, how do you get this many people to agree to go off and do something as horrible as this? Like, how have civilizations managed to do this throughout all of human history? Like, I mean, just think about yourself, right? Like, most of us are willing to, like, put our lives on the line for, I don't know, maybe, like, a handful of people that we care very deeply for, but most of us are very unwilling to do anything for millions of strangers. Like, it's just, it's too abstract at that point. Like, it's really hard for us to care enough about this many people to the point that we're willing to take any sort of action. Like, consider something as benign and straightforward as philanthropy. Like, most people don't even want to do like good things for other people unless there's some sort of emotional payout. So if it's that challenging to mobilize people towards philanthropy, how do nations mobilize thousands of men to go fight in a war that carries a very high risk of injury and death? Like how have countries in the past managed to do this and how do they continue to do this? Well, many civilizations just made enlistment compulsory for young men with military service regarded as a sort of like rite of passage into manhood. At least this was like the cultural explanation for it. The real reason, at least from the government's point of view, it was probably to make sure that they had, you know, enough manpower to stand a fighting chance at winning, you know, whatever war they were involved with. But the United States is a very interesting case because we don't have compulsory enlistment anymore. Like the draft was eliminated quite a while ago. So our entire military is volunteer only which means that military recruitment is really all about PR and optics. Like, how do I make the idea of joining the military and going to war appealing to as many people as possible? I mean, there are, of course, financial incentives, like you get paid, you get free tuition, which, especially in these times when college is so expensive, is actually a really valuable thing. But even still, like, how do you get people to get, like, excited about the idea of joining the military and going to war? Well, honestly, there's, like, a ton that we could go into here because this topic is really huge. But in the spirit of keeping this narrowed in on the topic of, like, male objectification, let's just zero in on the topic of military recruitment ads. So a couple of years ago, the U.S. Army released an ad called Emma, The Calling, which is a cartoon that narrates the life of a young woman raised by a lesbian couple who later decides to join the army. And this video went viral for all of the wrong reasons. So soon after its release, somebody uploaded a video comparing it to... Uh, China and Russia military ads. And this video went absolutely bonkers viral. Although it since has been removed from YouTube, but somebody re-uploaded it, so that's gonna be the version that I play here. So in the China ad, we see a man joining the military, going through training, and we see a bunch of spaceships, and we see a lot of like really intense combat scenes. And similarly, the Russia ad starts with a recruit staring intensely at us through the camera, before showing his progression from civilian life into combat life. And then we have the U.S. Army ad, which... is like a literal cartoon. One of these things is not like the other. But you've been listening to me talk for like the last 30 minutes. You don't really care what I have to say. Let's see what the people think. Let's see what the people of the YouTube comments have to say about these ads. China, inspirational. Russia, pure badassery. America, cringe. China, we will always be here. Russia, your past doesn't matter, only now matters. America, break stereotypes. Well, we know who's losing World War III. China, dragon. Russia, bear. USA, unicorn. And the ad even eventually made it onto Vox News, where it's basically mocked in the exact same way. We are becoming weak and pathetic. This is extremely embarrassing. The pussification of the US military only occurs during a Democrat-led administration. As an army veteran, this new army video is very shameful. Our military is supposed to be a killing machine we point at someone, not a feel-good safe space. This is horrendously embarrassing. So I find all of this incredibly fascinating. 
mostly because I think it illustrates a few things. The first is that, you know, people expect the military to project a very specific kind of image. Namely, they expect them to project an image of strength and power, which given the function of the military, which is, I mean, literally to like exert strength and power on behalf of the state, I understand why people have this expectation. I mean, it makes sense, but I find it very interesting that, you know, it's enough for just one ad to not line up with that sort of expectation to really shatter people's perception of our military strength. Like it kind of goes to show you that maintaining an image of strength like this is extremely precarious. And if people sniff out even one crack, like they will latch onto it and they may even write you off as being weak or pathetic. Along these same lines, you know, the second thing this illustrates to me is that optics for the military is actually like very, very important. So the United States military is objectively and without question, the most powerful military in the world. And I mean, you don't have to look any further than our military spending to see this. We spend over three times more on our military than China does, and we spend over 11 times more than Russia, at least before the Ukraine-Russia war. I don't really know if that figure has changed since then. But just by spending alone, we spend significantly more than every other country in the world on our military. Despite all of this, this one ad, this one like optical mistake was enough to give people the impression that our military is much weaker than China's and much weaker than Russia's. The last thing that this really illustrated to me, and the reason I'm bringing it up in this context, is that, you know, the way people criticize, like, the military as an organization is almost identical to the way people criticize, like, men as a group. You know, just reading through some of these comments, it was pretty clear that a lot of people almost, like, personify the military as this sort of like big strong man that's supposed to protect them. And when they saw weakness in that, it's like they were attacking this sort of like personified idea of how they understand the military. And I mean, you can even see this in some of the wording people use. Ted Cruz, for example, after seeing this ad, literally describes the military as emasculated. And what this solidifies, at least in my mind, is that, you know, what we expect from men seems inextricably tied to what we expect from our military. Like there's a very tight coupling between our ideas of masculinity and how we understand military strength. And I mean, this makes perfect sense, right? I mean, in some ways you could actually even argue that masculinity as an idea is sort of like a cultural feature that incentivizes men to want to join the military to begin with. I mean, again, even if you're a civilization that like forces people to join the military, you have to make people like want to fight. Like if people join the military and they don't do anything, they're probably not, I mean, it's not going to be very helpful, right? And so wanting to join the military and to fight has to become like an integral part of your identity as a man, and it has to be an integral part of what makes you valuable. In many cultures, including the United States, like the warrior is considered to be like a fundamental and like highly respected masculine archetype. In other words, warriors are considered sort of like the best kind of man, or at least that's sort of the story we're told. And so within this framing, you know, joining the military and fighting in a war is presented as an opportunity for a man to win this sort of like prize title. And men who try to avoid fighting in a war, or even worse, they go to war but then they desert, I mean, in cultures like this, these men are shunned and shamed. However, even though all of this mythologizing can sound very enticing, it leaves out one critical point, which is that war is actually terrible. And if you want like a literary exploration of this, I highly recommend reading All Quiet on the Western Front. It's by a German World War I veteran about fighting in World War I, which was a horrible war. And military leaders were literally sending these men into these wars knowing full well that they were going to die very quickly or, you know, they would spend months and months fighting in trenches and then dying. And the major theme of this book is that war is often highly glamorized, particularly to men, but this is ultimately just a scam. War is actually horrific and dehumanizing. It puts men under constant, unpredictable, and very intense physical stress for long periods of time. It forces them to witness the sudden, often gruesome deaths of their close friends. And oftentimes the only way human beings can cope in these situations is by completely detaching and dissociating from their emotional lives. Like they have to like numb themselves out in order to survive. And unfortunately, the trauma of having to do this 
It does not stop when the war stops if you manage to survive. It often carries with a person for the rest of their life. I've never mentioned this on this channel, but I have a family member who was actually a World War II veteran, and something that was very clear to me, especially towards the end of his life, is that he still suffered with some pretty severe PTSD. It was clear that this war that he had fought in over half a century ago still had a major impact on like his mental well-being. The reality of war is not something to get excited about or celebrate, and yet I do understand in this really messed up way why civilizations maybe had to resort to what I consider to be a sort of like deception in order to sort of energize people enough to actually go to war and to face it. But anyway, if we return to the language of objectification, I would argue that war, the military, and the sort of indoctrination that we have to do as a culture in order to get people to want to sign up to go to war, which I think is pretty tightly coupled with our ideas of what being masculine actually means, I think all of this unfortunately strips men of their humanity and it instrumentalizes them as tools of violence. Now, I've talked about all of this in the context of male objectification because I personally think that that phrasing kind of describes what's going on here way better than other terms that are commonly used, like toxic masculinity or male disposability. But regardless of like what phrasing you prefer to use, I think ultimately what people are talking about when they talk about these terms is not masculinity in general, it's the sort of like vestigial form of masculinity that used to serve a function in civilizations that needed to prepare for war, but that no longer maybe are quite as necessary. So do I think there is a crisis of masculinity? No, no, I do not. To me, the real crisis here is that we continue to reduce a man's value down to his willingness to reject his own humanity. And this is why I don't personally think that there is a so-called crisis of masculinity. What I think instead is happening is that we're going through a lot of change, things have gotten a little bit harder in certain respects, and as a culture, we've conditioned men to cope in ways that are counterproductive. We are still raising them to value a sort of wartime masculinity, something that was probably necessary for civilizations to stay safe in the past, but which is less necessary now. And I think people like Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson and other like masculine alarmists are way too quick to sort of essentialize these vestigial gender roles that don't serve as much of a function these days. And in my opinion, attempting to resurrect these vestigial roles is not really a solution. Unfortunately, this seems to be the paradigm in which a lot of man-oriented self-help operates. And that is going to be the topic of my next video. Anyway, that's all I have. Follow me on Instagram, join and become a member if you want to support my channel, and yeah, I guess I will see you in the next one. Have a good one, folks. Bye!